a suit and tie And get your hair cut way up high Get yourself a lawyer, son You're gonna need a real good one Time comes, time goes, things change, your life changes with it, but what remains constant is the need for a good lawyer from time to time to dig you out of those unexpected legal challenges that come along. We have one for you, David Whiting, well-known Melbourne solicitor, here to offer you some free advice. And I've got some free lines, one three hundred triple two seven seven four. if you'd like to call in and ask some advice from David Whiting. You can do so now, one three hundred triple two seven seven four. David, good morning. Good morning, Virginia. How are you travelling out there? Well, I don't know. Uh, tell me when the when the Premier's made the next announcement about the extension of the lockdown, then I'll have a better idea. Yeah. It's okay. Yes. It's, it's okay. okay. It's a, The job that I've got is one that just keeps going whether things are good or bad. I feel really, really sorry, though, for the people who are are unable to work. Has your work, though, changed in relation to COVID? Do you have COVID-related issues that you weren't dealing with before? Uh, no, it's it's more that the COVID creates a, a a gloss on how things are done. So there are protocols for remote signing of wills, um, and there's an issue about whether or not, while there is a remote protocol about the signing of powers of attorney, the all of the advice we've received to date is that a medical treatment, the appointment of a medical treatment decision maker, can't be done remotely. Mm. So, you know, so you use them, you know, uh, I, I prepare a will, I send it to you, I watch you sign it, you send it back to me, I witness it. It's messy. Right? Mm. So what might take 15 minutes takes 40. Yeah, right. But Do we have any homework bad. from last week? No, I know. I took the week off. So okay. no homework. <laughs> Yep. That's right. Then we'll take a refund from the vast amount of money okay. that we actually pay you Understood. as a retainer. One three hundred triple two seven seven four. Let's start with Adrian, who's calling from Maidstone. How can we help? Good morning, Adrian. And off he goes. Okay, Adrian, if you'd like to call back, um, I've got a line free for you, and we'll try and get you back on the line. I'm not quite sure what happened there. Andy in Frankston South, do you have a problem we can help with? Uh, yes, good morning. Thank you for taking my call. I'm trying to find out about um, an uncooperative executor of an estate in a family matter that um, I can't get any details on the will. I was just wondering what the um, um, what the procedure is to find out what's in the will, whether the executor has to give details of what's uh, in the will, whether on bequeathed anything or what what uh, the matter is. Uh, Andy, what's your relationship to the person who has died? Well, I'm a relative, but uh, I don't want to go... I understand. Okay, but, but, okay, do you think that you... Sorry, to your knowledge, have you ever been included in an earlier will? Well, I, I think I am included in the will, but I can't get a yes or no answer as to whether or not. Yes, I can't get a copy of the will. I can't... Find out Andy, there's a the provision in Andy. There's a provision in section 50 of the Wills Act from 1997 that says a person who is in possession of the will is required yeah. to give people falling within particular groups a copy of the will. Right? So if you are uh, a partner or a child of the deceased person. Yep. Um, or you have been included in an earlier will of the deceased person, you are entitled to receive a copy. Right? So you can you could go to the executor and you say, I believe that I'm entitled to a copy of the will pursuant to Section 50 of the Wills Act. Uh, please give me a copy. If you think the will is in the possession of a solicitor acting for the estate, the obligation rests upon the person with the will. So if I was the solicitor for the estate and X was the executor, you could make the demand of me and I would be obliged by Section 50 to give it to you. Yes, but I've, or, I've, or, I've made a couple of, of requests for a copy of the will and just for a yes or no answer, am I in the will or not? And they have got no response. Now, do I need to go to a solicitor to take legal action I, under I, that I would, section? I think, I, I think you're asking the... Technically, you're asking the wrong question. 
right? Oh. If you start from the proposition, I believe that Section 50 of the Wills Act entitles me to a copy of the will, please send it to me, then they, they would either come along and say, yes, you're entitled and here it is, or no, you're entitled and no. But I, I think it's more likely that the will will be with the lawyer than with the executor personally, so put the pressure on the lawyer. Okay. And I don't know who the lawyer is there either. Do you, um, have you, if you look at the Supreme Court, when did the person die? How long ago? A couple of months? Well, about eight months ago. Then I would be looking at the Supreme Court website, uh, supremecourt.vic.gov.au. Uh, you are able to search under online advertisements to see who which, uh, how the application for a grant of probate is being made, and you're also able to see whether the grant has been made. So that should, that should point you in the right direction. Good luck, and we hope that's useful to you. Uh, Bob has called from Bo Morris. What's going on, Bob? Good morning. I'm hoping that David can channel John because I've got a midlife crisis red motorbike pre lockdown up in Wodonga at the mechanics and I thought this lockdown won't be long and the mechanics said listen get it out of here mate it's going on till Christmas and so I've talked to the coronavirus hotline they've said yes it's a grey area talk to the police I've talked to the police they've said oh, I'll talk to the coronavirus hotline so I'm not sure whether I can go to Wodonga to pick it up I'll just go straight there and come straight back and it'll be a bit of fun because it's my motorbike and it's called Hilda. Why can't you get someone to pick it up for you? Why I'm a pensioner and I'm locked down and I'm starting to have mental problems without it. It's been a great help since the wife and the children and the mistress all left. <laughs> you must have a big house, Bob. Or did you Not have Not anymore. Serious? She took it. No. Okay. Uh, my view, well, I, I don't think that the, the laws would allow you to go and, and, and pick it up. Uh, I think the better answer would be to arrange for it to be collected and driven to you, taken to you. Good luck with trying to sort that out, Bob. There's absolutely no way that the person who's repaired it could just hang on to it for a bit longer? Uh, he could, but he's a sort of one-man go and he's only got sort of a two-person garage and he's got five motorbikes and I'm starting to become, you know, I, wanted, I don't trust people that much and I want to look at it before I pay and I don't want to put it on a thing it's you know it's a pretty good looking motorbike and I see it's complicated might end up in pieces somewhere else uh, Bob you'll have to try and see if someone else can pick it up that's really the only way and we certainly can't advise David can we that he break COVID rules and go and pick it up and no, I won't be doing that no 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 I won't uh, Bob uh, good luck it sounds like it's outstayed it's welcome uh, Mary in Carlton good morning Good morning. Hello, David. I have a question about the apartment I bought around uh, eight months ago in December. And it, this apartment um, advertised and also represented to me by the real estate as residential. And after about one month, which was the settlement day, a um, couple of days before the settlement, vendor solicitor contacted and um, and also he said to me that, uh, there are a couple of fees that they didn't disclose in Section 32 to me before, about 4000 And also they told me that, oh, this apartment doesn't have a uh, separate meter. So I asked my first solicitor why you advised me to put an offer. But then, anyway, I get rid of the first solicitor. I went to the second solicitor. And then the second solicitor said to me that this house doesn't have certificate of residential and uh, from Land Use Victoria and also City Council certificate is service apartment. So okay. they misrepresented me. Uh, a resi a I, I'm apartment. a little stuck, Mary. Uh, you bought an apartment. Your first issue is that the owner's corporation runs the hot water service. Is that the first issue? The first, I think the first and foremost was that they represented a service apartment as a residential on the ground that um, the vendor, the sorry, the um, landlord terminated the the lease with hotel, and they call it as the ground. Uh, that's the ground they had. They call it residential. Oh, okay, okay. So you've you've bought an apartment that that has been leased to a hotel operator. Is that right? So yeah. you, what you've actually done, so there's, there's really two questions in, in this, uh, 
Mary. The first question is, has the vendor misrepresented the property or have you received bad advice in relation to what you were buying? Because I'm, I'm familiar with uh, a couple of buildings in the city where they're, they're, um, the owner's corporation, sorry, where the plan of subdivision prevents people living permanently in the units so that they can be operated as an investment pool for the benefit of a hotel operator. Uh, so your question is really whether it's a problem with the vendor or a problem with your advice. A problem with the vendor, I guess. If I'm not a lawyer, but I think that that's um, that's misrepresentation because the advertisement. Then you have a different problem. Then you have yeah. your first problem is that you've settled, mm. and the assumption is that all of your issues disappeared when you settled. Uh, then what you then can do is you can look and see whether you have a claim for misrepresentation under the Australian Consumer Law. And where does that and claim that go? Will really, well, it, it can go to VCAT, yep. but it really depends upon whether the vendor is a in the business of selling apartments or whether the vendor is a, a private individual like Mary who would be selling the apartment. So if you or I bought it, Virginia and decided a couple of years later to change our investment strategy and sold it, then the Australian consumer law wouldn't give you, wouldn't give the buyer the protection that Mary's looking for. So she needs to be able to discuss whether the vendor is a dealer in these things yep. or just an investor who's moving it on, in which case uh, Australian consumer law won't apply. All right. So the best course of action right now would be? I would be sitting down with the contract with a lawyer and saying, well, who's my claim against and what does it look like? Good luck. And we certainly hope you can, because it sounds like there's been some misrepresentation along the way there, David. That's mm -hmm. that's that's pretty clear. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Um, Anthony in Melbourne, what's your question? Good morning. Good morning. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say if you had any experience or knowledge of the Marriage Act 1961 and whether or not it's possible for uh, a marriage to take place online. I refer particularly to sections. Uh, 95, 98, where it uses the term in the present. So I'm wondering if that is a physical presence or a presence in time. If you're not planning to get married this week, can I take it on notice? Uh, I'm planning to get married on the 11th of September. Okay, well then we can, I can take that one on notice and come back. The I understand the Attorney General does have discretion in this matter. Okay, I will still take it on notice. Let's later. hope that we don't have to take it all the way to the Attorney General. Um, how, how are you getting married online? How is that going to work out? Well, it's, it's not just me. I've got clients also who, whose partners are stuck overseas and they would like one of the parties to participate on an online marriage if possible. It's a big issue think, in, in the people out there. COVID I think the question in part will be, Anthony, whether or not... The, the, the question will be, where does the marriage take place? Now, where there the will be a... Like fish sure. well, but there are two different that's places. the question, right? And it might be, because you, are you, you were certainly familiar with uh, Middle Eastern proxy marriages at various times. I wouldn't think an so, online marriage is a proxy marriage. No, I'm, I'm just... Uh, your, yeah. This is... I, I will tell you next week, Anthony. I'll Please give do. you a considered opinion. All right. Just before, you before you go, Anthony, though, um, yep. so uh, is there, do you have a marriage celebrant who's prepared to do this online wedding? If he could get advice that it was valid and, and it was appropriate, he would consider it for sure. But the problem is, no one, it's this term in the presence, whether or not it's a physical presence sure. or whether it could and be an in time presence. I get that. And, and where is your, um, your uh, fiance, your partner, Anthony? My partner's here in Melbourne. I've managed to get back from Thailand in time before right. the major lockdowns. But I have clients also overseas in Indonesia and elsewhere who would like to, who got caught out in COVID and they would like to finalise their marriage in order to bring their partner on shore. Oh, right, because that, that would then make it easier for them to come back. Although, of course, it's very hard to get people here anyway, but at least it, it's a, it's another um, weapon in your armament, if you like. Uh, Anthony, well, it's, all right. it, it's a visa question, Virginia. If you're married, you can have your spouse back. If you're planning to get oh, married, no, no, no. you I get can't that. have your fiancé. Totally. Yep. No, but David, no, no, the point I'm making more broadly is that it's very hard to even get the permission to get to in these COVID times and with the caps oh, yes. on hotel quarantine to even get someone here. So yep. when you add that into the equation, of course, I can see the, um, 
the desire to do it. All right, Anthony, stay listening and um, we'll see if David can get you an answer for next week. Thank you for calling. Joan in Chadston, what's happening in your neck of the woods? Oh, good morning, Virginia and, and David. It's a, re- a building next door to me. I'm not getting anywhere really with the council, um, which I spoke to them when this particular building was going up. It's really the grant that the, that the government offered people to do and then these people next door have extended. So they've put a building next door to, to me, which is all, almost to my fence boundary. And the roof of it is is overhanging almost on the fence, which my uh, camellias and things are in there. They're guttering. Now, I'm not getting any. So, that, so said, sorry. So, Joan, if yes? your camellias are in there guttering, then your camellias are hanging over their fence line. Is that right? That's correct. So that's how close right. it is. I'm just saying that. Okay. And I'm just wondering... Uh, uh, have, you, have you found out who the building surveyor is? Yes, and I've spoken to him before he put that building up. And I said, who, who passed this, this, this uh, building to go ahead? And he said, I did. And I said, because my council know of it, but they didn't pass it. And I spoke no, to the council have... and they said... If... Sorry. We now have private building surveyors as well as council building surveyors. That's correct. Uh, and have you complained to the council that the building... Have I you have. looked at the building regulations to see if the building is built too close to the boundary? Isn't it, where, where are the regulations for it? Uh, you'll get them at a website called legislation.vic.gov.au and you want yes, the I building ha- regulations. Ha- I don't have that... Um electronic device to look it up you don't have the internet can, right. do you have someone who can no, i don't ha- have the internet sorry can someone help you You're with that in your life joan have you got someone who can possibly help you? okay yeah, i'll have to do that if david's saying that that has well to uh, well that's where you find the rules and then it will depend upon whether it's a habitable room or not a habitable room it will depend it's on windows ensuite, and overlooking. David, it's an ensuite I oh, asked the and a bathroom is, is not an ensuite a bathroom doesn't constitute a habitable room, but the building regulations will tell you how close they can get to the boundary. All right, so you'll, you'll have to get someone to look that up for you, and I'm sorry, Joan, that that's put you in a state and that you can't do that yourself. But if there's someone in your life who can look it up, that's the advice that David has for you. David, I'm giving a lot of texts here from people who are marriage celebrants, and they are adamant on this point following the question from Anthony. I'm a celebrant. I do not believe a video link is legal. Michael in Echuca says, as a celebrant, you cannot be married online under the Act. It must be in person. Catherine, who's a celebrant, says, absolutely not. No electronic marriage is allowed and on and on. So I think we're pretty firmly getting our answer there that it has to be in the presence. You've got to both be in the room. Physical presence, yeah, yes. Yeah, indeed. Uh, so that might be the answer, but uh, David will double-check that for you if you're still listening this morning, Anthony. Colin in Ballarat has a delicate question, but an important one. Morning, Colin. Good morning, Virginia. Morning, David. Um, Good morning. Yeah, mine. Being an older gentleman, sometimes older gentlemen get caught short and need to urinate, and sometimes you've only got 20 or 30 seconds. If you're driving along the street... Uh, and you need to go, what is the legal ramifications if you jump out of your car? Going back about 30 years ago, I think I heard it on Triple R's Lawyers and Guns and Money. They said there what was a law... What a great program that was. Oh, yeah, gee, was, that, that was more than 30 years ago. Yep. They said there was a law uh, that, going back to the horse and cart days, that if you needed to urinate, you could urinate at the wheel of your cart on the road side, not the footpath side of the vehicle. Uh, yes. And they said that was still a law at that stage. Okay, well, now, let, let's, see, let's see what David can establish. What do you think of this, David? Uh, I think that law's gone, Colin, but, but I'm very happy to come back, give you chapter and verse. Hey, hey, Colin, have you had an incident where someone has ticked you off or a police officer has said something to you about this? No, out on the highway, uh, you know, generally you jump out and you go behind a tree or whatever. Uh, I was actually coming out of Ballarat and I needed to go desperately. It was on a Sunday afternoon and uh, in the Ballarat there was an industrial estate, so I 
sort of headed, tried to head around into the back streets of the industrial estate, uh, so there was sort of nobody about. But I basically only just got off the highway, so uh, I was still probably within, you know, I, I had the car parked between me and the uh, the road, so... Uh, was, uh, it, was there, were there any ramifications, Colin, or did you no, get away no, with no, it? No, there's been no ramifications, okay. but it's just something that I thought. Like, no, I'm just I checking. was driving down Sturt Street, Ballarat, and I... Well, try go. not to do it in Sturt Street, Ballarat, Colin. No, I know. You'd, I, I, I was off down a side street and then try and run down an alley or something like that. All right, way. okay. We got the picture. David? Oh, I think I've got the picture too, Virginia. <laughs> um, <laughs> Sorry. And um, any, any advice for Colin here? Yeah, um, if it's if it's if you're at the twenty second mark, I'd be getting some incontinence pads, I reckon, Colin. Oh, that's a little brutal, David. Come well, on, it is absolutely brutal. It is, but you, one would one would have hoped that twenty you'd need a, you'd well more than twenty seconds notice. What do you think a of that advice, of Colin? I know that's brutal. Yeah, um, yeah, it's. Uh it's I've been thinking about that, but uh, uh, I don't know how good the incontinence pads are. If, you know, it might be for just a little dribble. Oh, I dear, oh dear. We, 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 can, we, can, them, we can save the detail. Colin, we hope you yeah. never need them. I, I suspect that uh, if you've been thinking about it, Colin, that might be a conversation you might want to have with your GP and go and have a chat about some assistance you might need there. But um, you're, you're ducking the, the strict legal advice there, David. Nothing to add? I can tell you that it's illegal in some states. I'll tell you what the Victorian answer is. Public urination is illegal in uh, Queensland, South Australia and the ACT, um, says Google as we're talking. Yep. And I will come <laughs> back with a Victorian position next week. All right. Let's see if we can very, very quickly just fit uh, Craig from Blackburn in before we go to talk about finance. Hi, Craig. Hi. Good morning, Virginia and David. Good morning. Um, Around the time of the large storm that hit the Dandenongs, we got a quote from a, a large company that does tree works, uh, yes. which was to um, do a number of works at our home. The quote was for around 5500 Now, we accepted the quote and we booked in a date, which that date is still in the future. Uh, a few weeks ago, we became aware of a young arborist and we asked if he could give us a quote and his price for the same work was about 1500 so we had about yes. a $4,000 difference. So Somebody's decided, got to pay for the advertising, Craig. Yeah, we decided we'd go, obviously, with the cheaper one. Um, yes. Now, when we went to cancel with the other company, uh, they pointed out to my wife that there was a 25% cancellation fee. Yep. Which um, we're thinking, we obviously should have read the fine print and been aware of that, but um, we're unaware until we um, uh, made the cancellation. Now, we obviously think that that's a little bit excessive given at that point. We, we understand that they've done work. They've come out and spent some time doing a quote. No, but you weren't paying for the quote in any event, Craig. You either accepted it or you weren't, right? Yes. Uh, and what you need to do is decide whether or not the 25% is a reasonable estimate of their loss. So it's a fee for, in a sense, it's the price you pay for withdrawing from the contract. Now, you could take the matter to VCAT to argue that that's a penalty uh, and unreasonable, so it's not a pre-estimate of the loss. Uh, but, you know, what you could, in fact, you could still take the penalty, pay the 25%, use your younger arborist and still end up financially better off if you had used the other company. Yep, that's right. So there goes that. So that one's a, that's a lost cause, Marcus. Sorry, David. Yes. Yes. Getting ahead of myself. Marcus Padley is waiting on the line. David, thank you for that. You have got a little bit of homework this week. I and have. I've got, yep. I'll, look I'll forward, stay at home and do it. I'll look forward to the one about in-person marriages. I suspect that's done, but let's nail that one down. Thank you, David. Thank you. David Whiting, and good to hear from all of you. I'm sorry we couldn't help more of you with your calls today.